a lot uh, on uh, cognitive semiotics and intermedial arts. Uh, he has done a lot of supervising uh, uh, in semiotics uh, in, in art and technology and <coughs> in cognitive science. Some of you probably already know him because he has uh, uh, made uh, very nice, interesting, valuable contributions to biosemiotics. So, um, yeah, very happy to have him here uh, as our last uh, speaker. And uh, so his uh, talk today, uh, it's titled uh, Performance Space in Theatrical Dance as Semiosis. Uh, and yeah, draw. <laughs> You are you are muted. No, we we, we cannot hear you. Okay, okay. <laughs> Can I mute you? Now you are listening. Yes, now we listen. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> hello, hello everyone. Good evening. First of all, thanks a lot to the organization uh, of this event. Thanks to the organizer for inviting me. And gracias, Israel, for, in for invitar me. Okay, well, I, I, I will present some ideas related to the phenomenon of performance space in dance, more specifically in, in theatrical dance, semiosis and inter semiotic translation. And well, ab about this phenomenon, I have been working on it uh, for the last few years, the theoretically and creatively, in collaboration with people from philosophy, uh, musicians, choreographers, dancers, designers. Well, the ideas I'm going to explore here can be summarized like this. Performance space in dance, or in theatrical dance, is the exosomatic embodiment of a problem space resulting from a process of intersemiotic translation. Well, performance space is part of a complex distributed cognitive system we call theatrical dance. This is, this is an overview of the most important points, assumptions. The beginning is about symbionts, cyborgs, and mind tools or cognitive artifacts and technologies. I'm trying to define these components, explanatory components of my arguments uh, to define my main research question. Then I will demonstrate some ideas of on intersemiotic translation as an artifact. Taking advantage of, of, of different examples in dance. At the end, I will indicate some implications for further development. Okay, among the most important premises of my talk, we are cyborgs, this very strange kind of, of symbionts. Not cyborgs as the Robocop, but cyborgs in the sense we are connected to prosthetic artificial devices to amplify biological natural abilities. We are coupled to penetrative and non-penetrative devices to work better from motor system prosthetic devices to perceptual to perceptual devices. Let me see. Yeah. But I'm not talking just about this kind of symbiont, a mix of biological, mechanical, electronic, or digital penetrative device. We are cyborgs in the sense we are connected to prosthetic artificial tools to amplify biological abilities, glasses to make vision better or more efficient, sticks like walking sticks to navigate in space, in, in, in urban spaces, old fashioned maps to localize the best network of stations, metro and interconnected stations, or a combination of technologies, like real-time interactive tools as responsive maps, 
that they are very good examples of non-penetrative cyborgs, cognitive cyborgs technologies. For, for Chalmers, for David Chalmers, who is one of the main important authors of extended mind hypothesis, perhaps the camera of my iPhone can serve as an, an extended perceptual mechanism. As probably, probably everybody here knows, even our bodies or part of our bodies, our hands, we use as tools, thinking tools, to distribute complex cognitive processes. We use, as the Nobel Prize, Richard Feynman, the, the winning Richard Feynman, we use our own body for representing, conceptualizing, and for reasoning with these con concepts or representations. As the climber Margot Hayes using her moving body to anticipate the climbing of Mount biography. And marking is an increasingly investigated phenomenon, cognitive phenomenon, complex cognitive phenomenon in distributed cognitive science. Or when we use our fingers to supersize our focused attention. Okay, indeed, according to this perspective, this approach, we are embedded in a huge variety of thinking tools and, and, and mind tools for several purposes. We use maps to navigate, notations to, to freeze, mathematical notation, logical notations, to musical notations, to freeze the reasoning to visual perception and to manipulation, and to control complex inferential differential process, processes, writing language systems to extend our memories, which are a very new cultural, cultural prosthetic device in terms of human evolutionary history. We use alphabets, numbers, graphs, diagrams, many different forms of diagrams to represent relations and meta relations. More trivially, we design and we use checklists, tables, pharmacological drugs and, and plants, cultivated plants to change our conscious states to increase or to increase our attention or to relax. Even the space we use to organize and categorize our thoughts and actions. As Clark and Clark has claimed, we are very, we are cognitive niche builders, extending the mind into the space to think better. Mind is out there, and this is not a metaphor. Mind is just less and less in the head. Although this evolutionary history, or the evolutionary history of this ability, or this morphological thread is quite old, and we find niche builders, niche that are constructed to improve skills and performance in many taxons, as Sterelny, the philosopher of science or biology, Kim Sterelny, has suggested, uh, although other animals engage in niche constructions, it is only in the human species that we see this potent, cumulative, runaway process of epistemic engineering. In, in our version, version of this phenomenon, that inspired by Peirce's semiotic cognitive externalism, we are semiotic engineers to think better. At this point, At this point, and according to my main working ideas, working hypothesis, intersemiotic translation is part of this process. Intersemiotic translation is a cognitive artifact. As we know, intersemiotic translation was defined for the first time by Jakobson, Homan Jakobson, the Russian semiotician in 1959, to describe trans transmutation of sign structures from verbal to visual, to visual systems. But in the last decades, this term, this theoretical term, has acquired other limits or other designations and has been used to refer to several forms, several processes of translations. It means among different systems or systems of several ontologies. According to our view, and this is the core of my argument, Intersemiotic translation can be described as a pump, 
a pump designed to distribute creativity in arts. Of course, we are very inspired by, among others, authors, inspired by Dan, Daniel Dennett's ideas and his book about thinking tools, intuition pumps, and the general notion of mind as a set of tools. And, and Clark's ideas and Clark's ideas and his books and many papers about cognitive artifacts. But our major influence has been early process, process, semiotic, and his externalist theory of cognition. Let's take here a quick detour into Percy's philosophy of time process and just go through some of the premises of the so-called semiosis in the active semiotic externalist notion of, of mind. Well, according to Percy's cognitive externalism, mind is semiosis. Mind is semiosis in a dialogical, materially embodied form in cognition is development of available semiotic material, artifacts, tools, technologies, in which it is embodied. Perse, and we have claimed it in many works, papers, and, and lectures, Perse is a kind of avant-garde distributed cognitive scientists. As David Kirsch argues, Perse first mentioned this idea that people use external objects to think with in the late 19th century, when he said that chemists think as much with their test tubes as with pen and paper. Sem semiosis, for us, is a concept that describes the most fundamental relations involved in processes of meaning and cognition as opposed to, to reactive processes. According to many authors, semiosis is the most general description of the internal structure of mind processes. An important implication of this fundamental premises, premises to that intersemiotic translation is semiosis is that this premise shifts the focus of our framework, our explanatory framework, from science to semiosis, to the action of science. Some scholars, actually few scholars, have, as far as I know, have been stressing this aspect of Kurz's theory of sign. Fish, Max Fish, the, the first editor of the first edition project in Indianapolis, highlighted that the fundamental conception of semiotic in, is not that of sign, but that of semiosis. And semiotic should be defined in terms of semiosis rather than of sign. Semiosis is a dynamic process with signs continuously translating into other signs in time, it, which means the mode of existence, the mode of being of a sign is to produce interpretative effects, interpretants, which in turn are new signs for new interpretants. Semiosis is an irreducible, a triadically irreducible, as most of you know, processes through which a constraining factor acts on cognitive systems or cognitive behavior because of the mediation of a certain entity or process. Okay, now returning to my main arguments or to my main ideas. Performance space in dance is semiosis or from different view, performance space in dance is the exosomatic embodiment of a problem space resulting from a process of semiosis, intersemiotic translation. Performance space is part of a complex distributed cognitive system we call theatrical dance. I have published with Pedro Atan almost two years ago, this paper, Emergent Sign Action. We have published this paper in this journal, the European Journal of Pragmatism. Okay. My first example, though, the first example we are dealing with is the classical ballet. Classical ballet is related to the construction of a cognitive niche, which involves, and this is the core of, of, of this idea, involves the introduction, based on intersemiotic translation, of the introduction of new cognitive tools or cognitive artifacts. The translation of a well-structured problem space the mathematics of one-point visual perspective to painting in architecture. 
this cognitive artifact invented or rediscovered and refined in 15th century Italy was applied for the for, to the design of, of scenic space for the first time in Teatro Olimpico di Vicenza, designed by Andrea Palladio in the end of 16th century. Radically, and this is the most important point, radically transforming the relative position of the audience in the performance, leading to the creation of proscenium arc stage in the fourth wall in theaters and producing a cascade of events that creates a new distributed, a new distributed cognitive system that we know as classical dance. The, the audience directly face the stage as we are facing it in this image and views only one side of the scene. This one side is commonly known as the invisible fourth wall of the scene. This cognitive artifact, one point perspective, transforms the fourth wall into a canvas. As a consequence of the introduction of this artifact, a radically new cognitive niche and a new set of problems were inaugurated, including a new hierarchy of spots on the stage. But the center is much more important than the corners. Now, there is a new hierarchy of locations. This is related to a new hierarchy of dancers. The first dancer occupied the center, occupied the center of, and, and the less important dancers framed the scene occupying the periphery of the stage. But this new system then favors the emergence of new motto vocab vocabularies, of new vocabularies of dance movements. As, as you see, a new vertical morphology of movements, transforming the dancer in an ethereal figure, which in turn creates a demand for the introduction of new cognitive artifacts, a new cognitive artifacts and new tools. For example, the pointing, the point shoes to support new vocabularies or new motor vocabularies. It contributes to more changes in the elevation of dance techniques, technique. Well, typically this is a causal looping, a strange causal looping between the, an ecosystem of movements and an ecosystem of tools and artifacts. What, what we see here, and of course, this is a very, a very simple model, no? can be described as a cascade of events where intersemiotic translation of a cognitive artifact one point visual perspective in arts and architecture inaugurates a new set of problems or a new problem space in theatrical dance yeah, or, or a new cognitive niche, the classical ballet. Next example. Next example, working on a very different scale scale of observation in terms of time and space, is Moise Cunningham. Cunningham is one of the most important choreographers of the 20th century. He produced innovations, historical innovations in, 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 in composition, syntax, composition, uh, vocabulary of movement, some water vocabulary, the relation uh, uh, with sound entities and processes, and of course, the performance space. He used the I Ching, or I Ching from the Chinese, Chinese Book of Changes and, and other tools, many different tools, as an artifact to introduce chance operation, random effects in dance compositions. The I Ching is used as a methodology, an, an external methodology for choreographic creation, a kind of proto-computing tool to explore new problems in dance, new syntactical problems in dance. According to Morse himself, he, by externalizing chance procedures, I have distributed the authorship of the processes. In fact, many external artifacts were applied to a set number of components. 
such as sequence of choreography parts, sequence of movements, movements duration, movements directions, location, the dancer's location, the choreography sequence, the speed of choreography sequence, and number of dances in, in each sequence. Here you see some scores for Sweet by Chance, a choreography from 1952. But dancers' location were determined by chance using many devices and protocols. According to Moore's, Sweet by Chance is exactly what it titles. The title says, in applying chance to space, I saw the possibility of multi-direction. Rather than thinking in one direction, which is exactly what happens when you dance in a proscenium frame with the fourth wall in classical ballet, it means to the audience in a proscenium frame, direction could be fourth-sided and up and down. As we know, John Cage was systematically exploring the use of several tools to produce random effects in music some years before, before Moss Cunningham. We also know that Marcel Duchamp had been exploring chance operation as an external methodology in visual arts, even before Cage. So we are talking about a translation, an intersemantic translation, a transmediation of protocols and procedures or a translation of problem spaces from visual arts to dance through Cage's music. In our simple model, in our simplified model, chance procedures and protocols translated from Cage's music modify the distributed cognitive system of Cunningham's dance. Again, what we observe is a cascade of events based on the translation of a cognitive artifacts, a thinking tool. In this case, chance operations translated from music, Cage's protocol, and impacting dance in several ways, and inaugurating a new set of problems. The, sequence, the sequences of performers' actions are changed, the hierarchical structure of performance spaces is reframed, the relations between music and dance are reconceived. Okay, at this point, at this point, the question is, if our thesis or hypothesis is correct, and if intersemiotic translation is a tool, is a cognitive artifact to scaffold, to distribute artistic creativity in, in many different scales of observation, how does it work? Intersemiotic translation is a meta-semiotic artifact in two aspects, at least two aspects. First, it is semiosis about semiosis, poetry about music, film about literature, and so on. Second, the process of translation can reveal properties of the translation source and targets, and works thus as a way to investigate, to investigate and experiment upon, upon semiosis. Intersemiotic translation is a cognitive artifact with the epistemic function of improving understanding about the translation source, its material properties and systems of science, and about the translation process itself. Intersemiotic translation allows metasemiotic operations of a critique and analysis of semiosis itself. As a kind of projection or projective augmented intelligence technique, intersemiotic translation works as an anticipatory and predictive tool, anticipating new and expected events and keeping under control the emergence of new patterns, of new patterns of science or semiotic processes. In fact, artists use many strategies to reduce the amount of data at their Disposal. From this perspective, intersemiotic translation decreases the complexity of the niche. At the same time, it works as a generative model, providing new and expected surprising, surprising data in target system. I would say providing competing ideas. 
translations translation allows the system to generate candidate instance for new experiments. From this perspective, intersemiotic translation increase the complexity of the niche, of the cognitive niche. Finally, it works as a problem solving strategy, framing new set of problems to be investigated. According to our description of Mercer's intersemiotic translation of chance procedures, based on the use of I Ching, this process provides anticipation of random effects based on cage exploration, systematic explorations of, of chance protocols in music, the generation of production of competing ideas and, and candidates for in several descriptive levels from, from composition, from syntax composition to motor vocabulary, and a new set of problems. A new set of problems introduced by the translation of chance procedures are related to unusual dance syntax organization, forcing the dancers to acquire new motor skills and coordination. A new relation between music and dance, dance as body movement is dissociated from anything, anything else. And a new hierarchical structure of performance space reframing the nature of observer positions. Let me go into the final part of my, my talk. Now, let's track some implications of these ideas, the ideas that I have presented here. They branch out to a, a broad array of fields of research, which are strongly interrelated, of course. I will point out some of them. Our approach suggests a new relationship between two emergent fields, intermediality studies and distributed cognitive science. This relation hopefully leads to a new research agenda and a new set of research questions. Considering translation as a cognitive artifact to scaffold artistic creative, creative processes in several time scales in distributed cognitive systems. In cognitive semiotics, or, sorry, in cognitive science, more specifically in creativity research domain, artistic creativity processes are describing, are described according to our perspective, our approach as an inferential non-psychological process externally distributed and strongly based on the action of different types of cognitive tools, of cognitive artifacts. In, in philosophy and history of arts, the attention is not centered on a history of ideas, neither centered on relevant properties, nor in a history of representational attributes and structures of art movements. The attention is actually centered on transformations of ecosystems, ecosystems of artifacts that scaffold the activity of distributed cognitive systems through intersemiotic translations. The attention is centered on transformations of cognitive needs that shapes that shape the activity of artists through intersemiotic translation. Our supposition is that many periods of artistic creativity, transformational, radical transformational artistic creativity depend crucially on the translation of artifacts, especially protocols, procedures, and, and methods between different systems. In this case, creative artists have their creative activity augmented by this by these tools, by, by this intersemiotic translation. Intersemiotic translation can be seen as implants on cognitive cyborgs, on, sim on symbionts. And to finish, performance space is simulsis. Simulsis resulting from intersemiotic translation, a translation of stable pattern of sign activity. Thank you. Thank you for
Thank you. And so uh, we open now. Th th thanks a lot, Joel. And now we, we open the floor for questions. We have one from Tartu already. So. Uh, okay, very good. Anna. Uh, hey, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so my question is, when you said uh, that semiotics should be uh, not be about science, but should be about semiosis, for me, that was sort of this, how to say, chicken egg situation, because if there weren't signs, how would you produce semiosis? So can you collaborate on that a bit? Yeah. Yeah. This is a new question. This is, this is a good question. I think that the, the, the point here is that, of course, we're talking about signs all the time. Uh, but the point, the more important point, I think, is the uh, uh, sign, it's a structure, materiality, and, uh, you know, substance. The sign itself is a kind of secondary, is a kind of, uh, the process of transformation of signs is, is, the, is, is, the, most, is the most important property in this case, we are, we are just trying to, you know, to, to put the focus in terms of epistemic and, and ontological dimensions in, 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 in the process, not in the, in, the, in the structure of sign or not in the, in, the, in, the, in the materiality of sign, but much more, it's much more important to understand what's happening, the process of translation of signs. I would say that, that, that this is just a kind of, uh, uh, this, this account to, to, to put the attention in terms of, you know, the, the methodologically speaking, you know, the, 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 pro, the, the, the property of transformation, the purpose of dynamic transformation, uh, time dependence, temporal dependence properties of, 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 of process, of the process. But, 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 but of course, well, you, 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 are, you are right. We are, we are talking about signs all the time. No? Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Anna, and thank you, Joao. And uh, so we have a question in the chat. Uh, can we translate a performative space into syntactic schemes without knowing the cultural model of the sign producer? Can we translate a performative space in syntactic without knowing the cultural model of sign producer? Hmm, I don't know, maybe not, no. I, I would say no, I, I would say... <laughs> That's also a good question, but I, I, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but I probably no, I, I think. I, I think the, the process is, 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 is situated all the time, as it is culturally situated. So the, 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 the translation, of course, is dependent of, of the, 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 the cultural model of, of, of sign producer and sign translator. Yeah, Marcelo. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yes, we have a question from here. Uh, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to ask, um, since you have uh, spoken uh, at the start about like the, the symbiotic relationship between uh, the human mind and uh, the yeah, <laughs> and, and machines, um, and then we got into creativity and semiosis and uh, creative processes, uh, how would you say uh, the current discussion about AI generated art fits into this framework uh, since many of uh, many especially artists tend to deride uh, AI generated art as just something soulless creatively devoid spread out by an unthinking machine so what, uh, what do you think about that if the question makes sense <laughs> yeah but uh, if how could you please uh, repeat the question because I'm not sure if I understand the final part of the question AI it's about artificial intelligence generated art ah yeah yeah well yeah uh this is a hot spot no in, in, in terms of you know you know algorithmic art and computational computer-based art yeah um well i think i think i think that this 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 phenomenon is part of the uh, what we are trying to to understand now is how to 
to produce using different com, uh, com, uh, different tools in evolutionary com, computer science based on you know genetic algorithm and 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 also in fuzzy logic and also in uh, based on on in complex neural networks uh, how to produce uh, uh, different forms of 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 combinatorial transformation or exploratory, exploratory uh, semiotic processes or or art sem or, or, or art static processes and uh, good examples of, of especially in, in electronic and in, in algorithmic music uh, there, there are good examples of, of uh, very interesting examples of uh, of different strategies to, and methods to, to to produce creative music i'm very you know i'm very optimistic i would say about the next the next years but of course i didn't i didn't answer our question <laughs> <laughs> I, I really just wanted to know your opinion so thank you okay <laughs> thank you thank you for your question thank you and uh, do we have so here uh, uh, Tyler has uh, some very interesting activities about randomization and writing and there are even some workshops with the uh, yeah. methods of writing that involves this randomization so mm -hmm. I'm sure he's really dying to ask some questions <laughs> <laughs> no I, I can but uh okay. yeah, may I just just one comment about the last the last question. Yes. I have I, I have published very recently, but in a in a, in a Portuguese uh, journal uh, on 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 language processing, uh, a, a small paper on 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 artificial generative uh, poetry, uh, based in, a, in, in, in based, based in a very uh, in different but very simple is, is strat com computer strategies to 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 make poems. Uh, I can I can send I I, I will send you Israel. I will send you uh, this this the, this paper and please uh, distribute you know, in this in this group. Maybe it's a good idea. <laughs> yes. 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 Definitely. Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, hello, Professor. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm a big fan of your work. And I think the, the topic of transmutation or intersemantic translation is very important for our group. We also had a semi song series just about this topic two years ago. And I also know that you are into, or you used to work in biosemiotics. Yeah. So oh, I wanted to ask you whether this work on the chance or randomness was inspired by Percy's evolutionary theory, the decastic evolution by chance. Is there some connection? Uh, uh, inspired by Percy's? Evolutionary theory, the decasm, the evolution by chance. Well, yeah, <laughs> this is a... <laughs> Good questions. Uh, okay, uh, let me think a little bit about. Yeah, I will. I will. I would. I would say that we are. Um, yeah, we are much more inspired by the 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 the, the notion of uh, ex external. Ex um, the notion of external mind, of course, the notion of mind in process in process theory of, of cognitive semiotics is very is very based on ontological principles, you know, developed in his in his metaphysics, and of course the the notion of thickism and cynicism and so, uh, 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 foundational notions in, 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 in metaphysics, but I, I I I would answer you saying that oh I, I I would like to say oh it's much more inspired by the notion of of that it's not possible to 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 describe mind process based on dichotomic division or uh, based on 
dichotomic categories of mind and matter. It's, it's much more inspired by the notion of semiosis as a, as, as a, as a or, or mind as a, as a kind of uh, as, a, as a kind of semiosis. And, 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 and especially dependent of the notion of, 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 of time dependence processes. Thank you. Yeah, do we have uh, more questions uh, from the audience online or here? Um, okay. Okay. We have a question here. Oh, yeah? Tyler, yeah. It's a very cool presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Slides. I saw. I noticed you use this technique of having just one sentence on a slide and then the quick movement through the slides. They say that it keeps the attention better. And it's certainly a more dynamic approach. <laughs> you, you know, empirical empirical scientists use it to you know to 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 use this kind of. It's very yeah. It's it's, it's a good strategy to keep the attention. You know, <laughs> in focus. In focus. Yeah. Yeah, I was struck by your example you used of this uh, performance dance artist that uses the I Ching to randomize the positions on the stage. Yeah. I noticed a particular hexagram, but then I guess it kind of relates to one question earlier from Anna about sign versus semiosis. Yeah. Of course, we can emphasize transformation and say that the interpretant is the main, our main interest. At the same time, the artistic object is defined precisely by somehow it's designed to uh, produce an interpretant. And thus we can describe the structure of the signification at a formal level of an artistic object insofar as it somehow is designed because of its, I don't know, uh, recursive yeah. structure, self-referential structure, somehow we can describe synchronically what produces this dynamic process or a diachronic yeah. process and so if transformation is our interest, it can be described either at the level of semiosis or at the level of the synchronic. And that's what, I mean, that's what makes artistic objects so interesting. But anyway, that's what brings me back to the I Ching. I noticed you had a particular hexagram. Can you see this hexagram? Yeah, yeah, from, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, that, I mean, so that the structure of the hexagrams is just like this, it's very simple. It's based in binary oppositions. Right? Yeah. Between single lines, but also between the two trigrams, which compose the hexagram, and somehow they come up with different ways that every line relates to each other. But it's nevertheless it's synchronic and purely binary. But anyway, this hexagram represents uh, holding together. Yep, yep. Represent what? Holding together. Holding together. Oh. Yeah. I don't know. I know it was on your slides. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I never translated that specific <laughs> I Ching to understand what exactly is happening. But uh, yeah, but that, that's a good that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, that's really fabulous. I think a perfect presentation to cap off the, the whole series. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In, the, in that specific case of tweet by chance, the the the, the one of the, the in 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 our in our in our paper we are exploring this, this idea that the object of that sign. It's a kind of, you know, it's a historical trajectory of the history of performance space after the introduction of one point perspective in, in the design of, in, in, in theater. So the, the, the object is a, is a structure that is that you can see when you are, you know, translating using new new cognitive tools. That, that's a very it's a very it's, it's very conic in this in this in this way I, I mean because we are you are you know you are observing the transformation of a history in terms of uh, in terms of production of new interpretants and of new interpretative effects based on, on the introduction of these of these and others hexagrams yeah yeah and I was really struck I mean I was really it's hard to put the finger on exactly what it was but your use of the notion of prosthetic limbs or other prosthetics or tools external tools in order to facilitate yeah. the process of transformation as though the constraint needs to be introduced between the interpreting subject and the external <laughs> in order to modulate this transformation the transform on yeah yeah the I Ching's perfect example of this but yeah, yeah we could yeah yeah no, you are right. I mean, the, 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 well, 
the idea, the general idea is that okay, we are we are we are embedded in a in, in a fantastically huge the paraphernalia in almost a huge variety of different tools to to do you know anything in terms of motor skills in terms of mental processes or complex simple or trivial processes of you know of of cognitive tasks yeah, and we depend on we we, we depend on, on uh, it's almost impossible to imagine any kind of activity without without you know Without tools, without, without, we have to be coupled to to to, to mind motors and you know perceptual uh, artifacts. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we have. Uh... Thank you. Thank you, Tyler, for your question. We have a, a comment or a question. I'm not sure in the chat. I will oh. read it. Uh, it says uh, it's from uh, Norihiko Kamaya, Kamaya uh, and it says, uh, I'm exploring whether it is possible to translate umwelt of living organisms or machines into human physicality. I think that by translating the umwelt of uh, the umwelt of other species, we can acquire various kinds of education from them. I feel that plants. Uh, for example, symbolically and physically imitating other species, has great potential in terms of crossing the boundaries between nature and culture through experiential translation. Uh, so yeah, I think no, that's more, more of a comment. Uh, but it will be a valuable comment because yes. it, it, it links uh, sort of both your presentation with uh, uh, yeah, and, and also to, to, you know, Israel, and also to use to Alex presentation, the first presentation, I was prepared to ask to Alex our question, and I didn't, I didn't. It's, it's, it's so space as, uh, is a kind of phenomenon of intersemiotic, interspecific intersemiotic translation. It could be described as a kind of, as a kind of inter specific and intersemiotic translation. It's a very good coincidence because yesterday I was reading this paper translation between non-humans and humans. I don't know if you, if you know this book. It was, it was uh, you know, it was published very recently, one month ago or two months ago, by, by Kobus Maher. I can send you, Israel, the, you know, the... Yeah, the... yeah. yeah we, we, we know Kobus, but uh, I think... Yeah. We'll look... This is the last book of Kobus. This okay. is the last book of Kobus. Translation beyond translation studies, and, and there's a very good chapter about you know, human and, and non-human translation. Right. Yeah, maybe, maybe maybe it's a very good idea to 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 explore this this in terms of of, of you know you, using you know uh, different different notions from from translation studies to understand what's happening when human and non-human are interacting in different ways yeah good yeah. point yeah did, did we have more questions from people here or from the audience in zoom uh, 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 yeah because i i have one question but it's um yeah i mean i don't know if it's really a serious question know, but <laughs> so uh because <laughs> When you were talking about um, um, Cage and, and Cunningham and, and all this, I immediately, well, yeah, just because of Cage, I was thinking of, of uh, Arto Lindsay's music as sort of a problem of translation from Salva <laughs> and uh, Weber and, and like, <laughs> so yeah. sort of this, uh, um, yeah. Um, yeah, Arthur, 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 Arthur Lindsay, the you know the Brazilian North American composer and uh, musician, is it's 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 maybe a, a very good example of of inter of of creative intersemiotic translation between different different systems, different semiotic systems or systems from different ontologies, and uh, he's very inspired by you know by concrete concrete poetry and also the new cinema of the, the second part of 20th century in Brazil and also in Latin America. Yeah, this is a very good example to, to be explored. 
I never, I, ne I never saw, you know, I, ne I never saw a paper, academic paper about about, about Lindsay using this, you know, these apparatus. Let's try. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that that actually would be really cool. <laughs> yeah. There are many examples. There are many good examples of of this this kind of operation to to model to explain, you know, the emergence of new paradigms in arts and or new movements, static movements. And I, we are in our group exploring different different examples of historical examples, Brazilian examples, but but also from 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 Europe, from Africa, and also from from North America. Yeah, good good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, great. So uh, we we have time if there are more questions for Madrid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, talking about Linux series, our party window is open. Yeah. So uh, if there are no more questions, then uh, well, we can uh, uh, end the session. However, uh, before we properly end it, uh, I would like to announce the next series. So uh, next semester we are going to have uh, a new series, and it's going to be called History and Praxis, and uh, it will deal well, with history and practice and subjectivity and, and where do we write history from and why do we write it for and who do we write it for? Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, it should begin in spring, like uh, maybe March or something like this. And, uh, well, just stay tuned and, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, spread the information uh, uh, and, uh, yeah. Uh, I, guess, I guess for this year uh, it's over, uh, but yeah, th thanks a lot. Uh, we're going to have a small party here. Uh, and, oh, uh, <laughs> uh, I would like to be. <laughs> we, we would really like uh, for every one of you who is consumed to be here because uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, we will uh, lead the the. the the Zoom on in case you want to you know, uh, chat uh, or, or uh, yeah. Which is going to be sort of inter-semiotic translation of. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, but uh, yeah, some uh, um, extensions of Umwelt and, and these kind of things will take place. And uh, yeah, some intersemitic translation, definitely. Uh, because, you know, we will also have we also have some wine. I think. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but yes, um, thanks a lot uh, uh, to everyone uh, around the world uh, in Tartu, in Brazil, in uh, wherever you are, uh, and uh, of course to our students here. And uh, yeah, see you next thank time. You. Thank you, Joao. Uh, uh, thanks a lot. For, uh, thank you, Israel. Thank you, thank you, people from Tartu, from Tyler. <laughs> See you soon. I hope. <laughs>